The word at World's End by Francis Brabazon is $1.95. In five sections of diverse poetic style, Francis Brabazon relentlessly wields his caustic wit to peel away the last veils covering our dying civilization. This book couples unparalleled imagery with a stunning honesty as the author turns his penetrating gaze to the art, the religion, and the everyday life of man on this planet today. The word at world's end will in centuries future stand as the most eloquent document of the death rattle of the contemporary spiritual wasteland. Yet the book is Phoenix also, sowing the seeds of the new humanity amidst the ruins of cadaverous illusions. That's a pretty good intro. That's a great intro, yeah. Who great. wrote it? Do you know who wrote it? Probably Chapman. He was the one making all the money out of these books, so probably Chapman. Oh, I'm sure he was like rolling in money from these. Rolling in money. He's, he actually can't find them. They're in boxes in a warehouse somewhere in Colorado, so no one has them much. Well, oh. you, you're bound to get rich at $1.95 a pop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mars bars or M&Ms. Excuse me, what's the exact title? Is it The Way at World's End or The, the Way word, at World's End? The word. the word at World's End. Word. Word, word okay. at World's End. Thank you. Did you say that it's Find available it online? online? It's not a PDF. Somewhere? Is it a PDF or is it There's online? no PDF, no. I don't know why Ward didn't do it. All the others are done, but he didn't do that. He did other uh, Brabazon books are done? They're all done on AMB PPCT. Hmm. Wow. I knew the Bible books were, I mean, the ones. All the Brabazon books are on AMB PPCT. That's good. All right. So this one. So, so let's, let's like officially get started because it's, you know, 10 after that's plenty of buffer. Um, so I, I was, so uh, the last couple of weeks I was scrambling around trying to get a copy of this darn thing because I couldn't find, um, I was sure I had one and I couldn't find it anywhere. And so then I started asking to borrow there was one at, available from abe's books you know for twenty dollars plus twenty five dollars shipping from australia and i didn't want to pay that much this morning anyway i finally got one and i started um i started reviewing it or previewing it a few days ago and uh in the process of that i i kind of decided how i'd like to to do this what i discovered in the process of reading it and trying to read it rather closely when I, whenever I really want to get something, I read with a pencil and a highlighter in my hand. And what I discovered is that almost every stanza had something that I didn't understand. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was either a word that I didn't understand the usage, or it was, uh, I wasn't, there was a clause and I didn't know who the referent for the clause was, you know, and he's got some fairly long ones in there and, and some that are a little strange. And, you know, it's just one thing after another. So um, I've, I've done, I, I've been a couple of years in an online poetry class that this poetry professor out of Penn does that's gotten really huge and, and famous. Now he, he does it every fall and there's like north of 100,000 people that sign up for it and participate and they have they have satellite workshops all over the world and so forth and so on and they do these these uh, close readings they call them of their poems and they really get down to it he's there with a little panel of his graduate students and he'll assign in, in some cases he'll assign each one of the graduate students one word from a line and then they'll they'll go in order and that student will talk about all the different ways you could look at this word, what it might mean, what it could mean, what it, what external references it pulls in and so forth. Anyway, they really take it apart. And I don't does think we- Does he speak we, Pardon? Does he speak Strine? And does he know the British utopian socialist um, aspects of the first uh, poem? You'll have to ask him. I can give you. I can give you his contact. I oh, know. Um, I don't go to someone famous. I have my studies under my belt. Thank you. <laughs> famous um, is not Francis. Is in my thing. <laughs> but anyway, I don't. I don't. I don't think we have to go through word for word. But what I'd like to do is read maybe 
uh, about four pages in a chunk in our first pass, and then go back and take it stanza by stanza, and I'll have somebody read, you know, the, a stanza again, and then we'll talk about it. And I'll and I'll have questions that I ask because I've been over it fair, fairly care, carefully, and these are the things that, you know, puzzled me when I when I looked at it, and so I really want to break it down very carefully like that. So then we'll we'll make it back to the end of that chunk of four pages. And then we'll need read uh, the next chunk and we'll read the chunk straight through, you know, beginning to end. Then we'll go back stanza by stanza for that. And in so doing work our way through the poem. And then when we get done with that, I'd like to do um, a second pass where we just read through it without stopping so that we get the full kind of uh, flow of it. Yes, Elizabeth. So um, how, how are you tying this in with Stay With God? I missed that part. It's nothing to do with Stay With God. It's this book, The Word at World's End. Yeah, I thought that I thought in the description he was tying it in with Stay With God as well. Well, my, my, plan, my plan is, Elizabeth, when we finish this book, to move on to Stay With God. Oh, OK. okay. But, you know, not any explicit connection, necessarily. Oh, OK. I thought you were tying them together. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, so that's my idea. And as I say, I have made scans of it so that it will be, I'll, I'll share my screen, it'll be on the screen. And then uh, I'll just take volunteer readers and we will uh, pass through it. Um, yes, Chris. I volunteer. Oh, okay, but hold on. Just a <laughs> so um, I wanted to start with an intro, but Rainy kind of already read one, so we'll we'll just say that that's our intro. But Rainy, can you tell the little story about when Rano was working on this? I thought that was kind of a good story. You're muted, Rainy. You're, you're muted. When Rano had to type this book, it was right after she typed the delightful four and twenty blackbirds, so the contrast was difficult. And she went to Barbara, this was just during Dreams of Wet Pavements, not the other beautiful aspects of it, this statement, Dreams of Wet Pavements. And she went to Barbara and said she was having trouble and she wasn't enjoying it and she didn't like typing it. And Barbara said, you need to type it, just think of my name, you need to type it, you have no idea how important it is to my work. I read somewhere, and in fact, it may have been in the little write-up that you did that's on the francisbravison.org site, but something about he told her, you know, she was, it's, it's, it's pretty tough. I, how many of you have read it already? Yeah, so we got two or three that have it. It's, uh, you'll see. I think it's, memorized it. John Isaacs memorized it. And seems uh, it's, it's pretty gritty stuff, and so Rano had a, a fairly strong it reaction. Out, interestingly, it came out as a published book before In Dust I Sing, and also it was possibly, you know, In Dust I Sing and the 150 guzzles of, well, even more, the 150 included in In Dust I Sing were all written in 62 and 63, and uh, um, there's a few like stragglers that came in for birthday presents and things through to 68, but they're all written 62 and 63. Good. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's get started. Let me share my screen and pull up. Uh, and I do want to I do want to start with the preface. Uh, in fact, this preface, it's kind of Baba Baba. It's Francis talking about um, his approach to poetry. And I, I was, I had read this years ago and I was remembering it recently and I was trying to find it. Uh, and I read the prefaces of everything else I had, my whole stack, and I couldn't find the thing. Uh, and this is not the poem where I would have expected it to show up, but sure enough, when I finally got my copy of this, um, there it was. So let me see if this is the PDF screen. I think it is. Ah, okay. So this is the, uh, the cover. You've already seen that from Rainey. And we'll get to this little passage here, so we won't stop on that. Uh, shoot, for some reason, these things did not open alphabetically, but I'll try to follow it. The cover piece with other books by Francis. 
six, one, three, three, there you are. Okay, so the um, published in 1971 by John F. Kennedy Press, I read somewhere that Francis had wanted this poem, he wanted the audience for this poem to be the general public. Um, and so he was interested in a, a publisher, uh, not a, you know, a Baba publisher so much. So anyway, he ended up with um, John F. Kennedy Press. It's a little oh, the deeper. first poem, not all the poems, Dreams of Wet Pavements. Oh, Dreams of Wet Pavement, okay. And so the contents, it's in five sections, uh, A Dream of Wet Pavements, Elegy for the Young Poets, The Ballad of the Rhyming Night, After the Flood, and Hymn to God the Man. And that actually reminds me that I did want to read this one little thing from the other introduction. Let me get that back. Uh, it must be this one. Yeah, so it says, um, <clears throat> the title is an echo of The Well at World's End, a 19th century fantasy novel by William Morris. It deals with a nightly quest for a transforming and renewing magic well. Francis is referring to a different sort of end of the world, the imminent apocalyptic manifestation of the God-man, which takes place when he breaks his silence to utter his word. Morris was a man of vision who condemned the greed, materialism, and dehumanization of the modern world. So I thought that was a sort of an interesting uh, antecedent for this. Yes, we all read all of William Morris's books at Francis's suggestion in the uh, 6970. Okay, um, so Randy, why don't you why don't you read the preface? With today's preoccupation with mere sound relations of words and poetry, my work has drawn the criticism that it lacks craft. Yet I do not think there are many writers who work harder at the craft of poetry than I do. In fact, most writers, whether avant-garde or pop or famous, only have to satisfy a public which has been carefully conditioned by every gimmick the genius of publicity can invent. But for years now, I have had to satisfy God mm -hmm. and not the God who is dead or who changes his face according to theological expediency or political necessity, but the God who is God man, the beautiful person who is the beloved of all who do not live for bread alone, who is so alive that all other persons are shadows emerging from the limbo of consciousness for the moment of a gesture or cry. But I have always considered that the real craftsmanship is in the shaping of the initial idea, not in the mere sounds of the words used. So I have infinitely crafted my idea before beginning to write and in my best work the idea forged its own form of expression. In Stay With God, the opening line came to me 12 years before I wrote that book. And it was not an odd line jotted down and forgotten. I carried it with me, noting its possibilities and acquiring the material it would need, i.e. Kailash. The word at world's end began with a short poem written and published in the London magazine in 1954. The possibilities of its development and extension were apparent. And six years later, I began making notes on it, some 200 pages of them, including some 50 formal sonnets as a preparation for after the flood. When I began the actual book, it went very quickly. The elegy, for instance, was finished in two sittings. The concept that the idea is the main thing, the reason for a poem is as old as poetry itself and it has always been the basis of the greatest work. The sound theory is a recent one, a natural rationalization of the state into which poetry has fallen. Poets on the whole, not having the firm ground of a knowledge of the divine truths of creation upon which to stand and serve with their art, 
must necessarily occupy themselves exploring sound combinations. Yet, I feel that the word at world's end does provide interesting sound patterns, and I have paid considerable attention to structural variety. These things have their importance. They give charm to the truth of the idea. They beguile the mind into accepting what the heart knows. They make entertainment. And to entertain the beloved is the only valid reason for a poem. But he is never entertained unless the original idea is shaped in his shape. All right, thank you. And uh, a dream of wet pavements. And um, why don't we take them, uh, let's do like everybody read like two pages and then we'll, we'll rotate the readers. Um, so Chris, um, in fact, Chris, why don't you read, I think this first section is three, I, I wanna do three pages and then we'll stop and, and do our close read. So why don't you just read all three pages? Okay, all right. A Dream of Wet Pavement. I sing within a night that's lent to soap and axes, to invent new slaughters of the innocent where patient rats gnaw tired cement. A night song in a dreadful night, batteried by the fluorescent might of strident trumpets in a fright, bellowing bitchery's delight, which wet pavements shape into dreams that softly sigh, there's more than seems. Behind the fret, beneath the screams, there flow perennial love streams. In this night, which neon makes day, the easy speakmen are raking hay for big fest who doles them their pay and nubile girls sing a roundelay. To men in shirt sleeves, each alone, gnawing his flesh down to the bone, the evening is a stifled groan of the day's rasping monotone. And gazing at the ghastly glow of neon's blood in silent flow, their spasms and their twitchings grow, knowing the cocks will surely crow. And youth in theaters, row on row, sit cheek to cheek and glow to glow, fearing the crop that love may sow, which they with their teeth will have to hoe. And smoldering bosoms, brazeared snow, shines with a phosphorescent glow, hiding breast bruises that would know why joy goes quick and night so slow. Each bust is a hammer in the brain of each prisoner on his chain, on whose lips words are made profane, the acts of which love's laws maintain. In the sophisticated light of plush caves, vocalists recite in strangled tones the bed's delight. The red cocks range themselves for fight. The cocks grow red, the red cocks crow. A hair divides high note from low. Man hair, girl hair, united know the magic of electric flow. The wind sighs round tall Mod Con huts. A door opens and smiles and shuts. Foreign fingers and thighs score ruts. The dawn peeps over trays of butts. There needs to be one more. Uh after that, before the next section. Nightmare refreshed, we rise from bed, tighten the loose screws in our head, breakfast on sawdust and liquid lead instead of fresh, plain fashioned bread. Okay. All right, so for those of you who are new to it, that'll kind of give you the tone. <clears throat> so I wanna back up to the first stanza and uh, just talk about it a little bit. So um, my first question that, that I had, I, I sing within a night that's lent to soap and axes to invent. And so my first question was why soap and axes? I think is my, my feeling on that is that, uh, is he's talking about 
the average the constant bombardment of advertisement that that uh, that we hear on every media source that we've got advertising different things from soap to axes so the night is lent it's given it is lent over to that kind of bombardment of advertisement but i don't know if that's right or not but that's one uh, possible well, interpretation of it that's uh, you know what let me let me just uh, give me a, just a second because i i can't see everybody that's in the meeting on my grid so if somebody wants to speak uh, okay maybe i can um yeah chris i i had the same um I had basically that same notion about it when I, as I read on, because he actually talks about soap in a variety of forms in the poem. He gets into soap operas and, and he talks a lot about advertising and the bombarded by that. And there's also this sort of theme of, of dull random violence sort of coursing through everything. So I, I guess the axes kind of pull that in. Uh, so yeah. Elizabeth and then Christina. Well, actually, I, I am a poet, that um, not a Baba poet, but I've written poetry since I was 13. And um, I, would, I would not stop after two lines to get the essence of what that means. So to me, you have to read, the, I sing within a night that's lent to soap and axes to invent new slaughters of the innocent where patient rats gnaw tired cement. Um, the biggest uh, issue for me is what they mean by patient rats gnawing tired cement. What is that all about? Something hard and who eats cement? Uh, rats, who are the rats? Um, Capitalists. Capitalist. Yeah. yeah, but uh, okay, I'm a tabula, tabula raza. I do not know what's in Francis's head and what he said about commercialism, marketing, anything like that. So none of that is in my head. I'm just uh, reading it as I would if I were writing a, a poem. And so who, what, uh, what is the slaughters of the innocent? Okay, so I, I need to stop you for a second, Elizabeth, and I'll get to you, uh, in, uh, Christina. But I, you know, once we read a stanza, that has a context as well. And we'll get to all that, but I wanna take it a bite at a time and you know, I anticipate that we're gonna to have to talk about slaughters of the innocent and we're gonna to have to talk about patient rats, but we can't do everything at once. So I do wanna I do wanna sort of march through it a, a bite at a time. We'll we'll hopefully have enough passes through it that we can put it all, all together uh, in the end. Okay, Christina. Uh, that first line, I sing within a night that's lent. Um, what I notice in Francis's poetry is that he loves the double entendre. He loves making words have two meanings. And what's Lent? Lent has a religious meaning and it also has a meaning like to lend. So I sing within a night that's Lent. In the, and what is Lent? Lent is to be without. So I sing within a night that's Lent. To me that it means both those meanings. He's singing, that his poetry is a form of singing. And it's a night, which means it, this is not a, a place of, of, of light, it's a place of darkness. And it's Lent, it's without. And it's just given to us. It's just given to us. So both those two lines mean two different things and I think he needs both of them. Yeah. To soap and axes to invent. And that directly relates to Slaughters of the Innocent, which is that painting about animal dissection. And uh, soap and axes to invent. So the soap and the axes are what you need to have when you go into an operating room. You have to have your scalpel and you have to be clean. So it's a night that's lent. It's, um, the, the, it's a place without that you go in and you're trying to dissect something, but you don't have light and you don't have, you're without what you need to do the dissection that you need and where the patient rats gnaw tired cement. Those are the people who are actually doing the operation. Those are the, the intellectuals who are trying to, you know, work it out 
And really, the rats are, again, double meaning there. The patient, meaning calm or, you know, uh, waiting, and patient, meaning also the slaughters of the innocent, it's all about dissecting animals. So the, the rats are the patients. So patient rats, not tired cement. What's cement? Cement is something that is just like fixed, it's stone. So to me, this whole stanza sets it up for how he is singing within the context of an intellectual world or um, framework, uh, a, a humanity that's doing in the darkness, a dissection of things that they don't even have the tools to do and they're without a clue as to how to do it. So to me, this whole par this, this, these four lines right here are a setup for, for the, a very negative setup. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the slaughters of the innocent is not his line. He's taking this from various other people's use of slaughters of the innocent like Herod and other people that have used that beforehand. That's well, why. it is the famous painting of the, the vivisection, yeah. you know. Right. Uh, Christina, can you elaborate on that? I'm not familiar with the painting. And can you, so can you tell us? The Dutch that? painting that um, uh, I, I have art history in my undergraduate, so uh, I just am aware of it. And um, you can look it up, though. If you just type in Slaughter of the Innocent, I'm sure you'll find it. There's a number. Massacre of the Innocent is something different. Um, and the title of the painting is Slaughter of the Innocents. And it's a medical arena where they're dissecting animals because uh, the religious and moral um, implications of cutting up human beings was not quite cool in the beginning of the 1800s, end of the 1700s. It still was like, you know, you don't do that to a human being. So they were trying to figure out uh, anatomy and, you know, uh, 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 ailments by looking at animals. So they're cutting up animals and it's a painting of the- Right, the, so, the so there is there is also, there's a more recent movie or play and it's also, I, I noticed, called Slaughter of the Innocents. Yes, and that's when a, I looked up, when I looked a up common phrase. Hang on, hang on, please. please. Um, when I looked up Slaughters of the Innocent, I didn't find anything. I found a couple of different references for slaughter of the innocents, but not this one. And yet it's in italics. And so it seems like it would be referring to some particular work. Okay. And Rainy, the fact that it says Rainy, rats. And, Rainy and then Chris and then Christina. Uh, I think that it, it's been referred to many, many times. And even in the, the Lord's Prayer, Herod's a world of, of slaughter of people that don't matter, you know, the, this, this poem is in support of the working class, of the lowly man, of the beginnings of Francis Brabazon, of the horrors he saw when they tried to be the lowly man from the well-educated man in England, and they tried to be the lowly man, and they found out what the lowly working man became. So the slaughters of the innocent is probably in respect of everyone that might have used it before 1962. Um. Definitely Herod's Slaughter of the Innocent is uh, associated quite often, I believe. Okay, so, so, Chris, 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 let, let me be traffic director if I may. Uh, you are first in the queue, but I, I wanna make sure that people have space to say what they wanna say without worrying about interruptions. So Chris, then Christina, and then myself. And so, me, you forgot me. Oh, I didn't see you. Uh, I, I, looked, I looked up the painting. That's why I wanted to say okay, something. Okay, so Chris, let's make it Chris, Christina, Elizabeth, and then Greg. Yep. So uh, Greg, if you want to look up that painting, it, it's put in Slaughter's of the Innocent Dutch painting, and you'll come up with a whole bunch of images, none of which are animals. I, I thought it was Slaughter of the Innocents. That's what Christina said. That's what I, I think that, that's what I meant. Slaughter's of the Innocent Dutch painting, and uh, you'll come up with a, a bunch on Google. But I think uh, going back to what uh, Franey said, uh, Herod, isn't this uh, probably a reference to uh, when Herod wanted to kill all of the male children in Israel or Jerusalem or wherever it was, because he had heard that there was a new king being born. And so he slaughtered all the innocents. 
So I think that's probably where that first reference goes back to. Now, uh, then uh, in some of those paintings that you'll see there, they look like, uh, you know, it's, uh, it could refer to war and to various things like that, but it probably goes back to that image from the Bible about Herod, about Herod what happened there. Um, and then the, where patient rats not tired cement, my, my feeling about that is that it's, uh, he's probably talking about urban, you know, the, the kind of an urban landscape, the, the city landscape, which I think he equates with uh, the sort of the opposite of nature is the urban landscape and um, kind of the decay of that is, is where you're, it's, it's a city overrun with rats and they're gnawing on the, uh, on the cement, you know, as, as a metaphor of just urban decay. That's, that's what I think of when I see that line right there. I still yeah, think please. soap and axes is probably more uh, a reference to uh, to ads, advertisements, and things like that. Okay. And the slaughters of the innocents is going to be uh, what it what all that does to humanity is all that that it just basically slaughters humanity. Is my my feeling about it. Okay, that's all it. right, Christina, then Elizabeth, then Greg. Yeah, I'm going to take my interpretation back because it's a rather obscure reference. And um, the what got me was the patient and the rats. But you know what? I, I'm going to take it back. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But uh, I do think it's a negative picture that's being painted. Yep. And it's, um, I will say, I'll stick with that double entendre on Lent and I'll stick with the double entendre on patient. Um, but I'll have to think about it some more and I'm liking I'm listening. So I'll, yeah, next. Okay, Elizabeth. Okay, so I just want to support Christina because um, it, I looked it up on Wikipedia and there are three references to something similar. One exact, Slaughter of the Innocent, uh, done in 1983 by Hans Rusch, discusses scientific okay. arguments for using animals as necessary for medical progress which use a rush considered to be needless or could be made needless by further research, progress and methodologies in basic science. But, but this the was other- written in 1962. The, this, was written, this poem was written in 1962. Okay, uh, I'm just giving you what I found. Um, there's also um, in Wikipedia, it says Massacre of the Innocents is the biblical account of infanticide by Herod the Great. And then what's also interesting, Pavonia Massacre and Massacre at Cor Corlears Hook, New Netherlands killings on February 25th, 1643. Anyway, that's all. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I wanna respond to various of you. First of all, Christina, I, I, I loved your interpretation about patience and everything. And I think that um, it's fine to just throw stuff into the mix because who knows? And, and you know, our, our minds and our subconsciouses will sort it out. And um, I, I think it makes the whole thing richer. So I, I, don't, I don't want you to be afraid to- uh, Oh, don't out. worry about that. Yeah, probably, probably don't need to. <laughs> Anyway, your worry is well. Your worry is well intended, but not well placed. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to uh, support you on that one. And as far as the slaughters of the innocent, I, again, the issue that I had was that all these specific references I found were slaughter of the innocents, and so you, and so that meant that this didn't seem like it was actually a specific reference. And the more I listened to. Um, all of you bringing up these various things that it has been used to refer to, the more I think that I, you know, I'm just kind of trying to reverse engineer Francis's process here. And I think that he, he, admit, he was certainly aware of these various works in, in various media, as well as the Herod story, I'm sure. 
And I think he wanted to make reference to those works. And so he's sort of used the italics. He's taking a little bit of liberty in capitalizing this and putting in italics as if it were a title, because he's sort of referring to a whole group of works, including the new ones that are, that are being created. So I, I noticed that Francis is, he takes a lot of liberties with uh, a lot of things when he writes. And so anyway, that's just my interpretation of what he's doing there. Poetic license. Um, yeah, that makes sense actually, Greg. So um, as far as the patient rats, uh, yeah, Chris, I, I, I resonated with your interpretation, even though I, I love Christina's and, you know, that'll be part of how I read it from now on, I think. Um, but it's definitely a picture of, I think the rats, you could interpret them as sort of the working people. The working people sort of show up through this poem quite a bit and, and the, the, the difficulty of their, their lot. Yes, and this is all that's left for us to eat. Oh. If we can kind of hold on, I know everybody's enthusiastic, but it's, it's disconcerting to, to be interrupted. So I'll try to get to everybody quickly, please. Um, the, the gnawing tired cement conveys this very um, malnourished environment. It's an environment where it's hard to find nourishment. It's everything is sort of um, uh, adulterated and, and sealed over and fused in with high tech junk materials and so forth. And so it's this picture of, of this, this working person just trying to just trying to eke out enough enough nourishment to even to live. So that's what I said. Okay. So I saw Christina had her hand up. Did anybody else? And and Rainy, did you want to elaborate on what you were talking about before? If you I do, put mine up again too, Greg. Whenever. Okay. So let me let me let me make it Christina, then Rainy, then Elizabeth. Go ahead, Christina. Okay. Um, uh, I will say there's a, a book by uh, James Joyce called Ulysses. Mm -hmm. And um, there are reading groups that do what we're doing right now, which is look at it line and paragraph, stanza, whatever. And it takes them four years to go through the book and then they start over again. So if that's what this is, I don't think it's appropriate. Not that it's not fun and good. And I love it. Actually, I love that stuff. But um, uh, James Joyce had like an army of people helping him to create stuff that had that kind of depth. I think that um, Francis Brabazon was a deep guy and well read. And in his preface, he does say that he worked really hard to be a good poet, which means, you know, using other poetic references, uh, you know, and, and world references and, and meaningful references. So, but I just don't think that you can mine it forever. That's all I'll say about that. The second thing is the difference between slaughters of the innocent and slaughter of the innocents is an S. And the S has been taken off of the fourth word and put onto the first word. And it's prefaced by a word new. So again, the lover of the double entendre, the lover of the double punch, I think he's saying it's a new slaughter of the innocents, but it's not even a slaughter of the innocent, it's slaughters of the innocent. So I'm gonna take back my vivisection reference and I'm gonna say maybe it is biblical, uh, at, but that it's a new insight into it. And it's not just like a section of the population and a one-time event. It's an ongoing series of events about anyone who's innocent, not just the little babies. So, um, I, so I think he's, he's setting it up here, real negative, real uh, aggressive and uh, soap and axes. It's clean, it's murder that's clean. It's nice and it's, it's, it's clean with soap. So I don't know, just, there you go. Okay, I just wanna make a short response to your first comment and then we'll move to, to Rainy Elizabeth. 
my feeling is that um, I want to dig into it this way. And I think that if anyone who doesn't, who thinks we're digging into it too far, don't feed the fire. Don't throw <laughs> your own comments into the mix if you want us to move along. But as long as, as long as people are making those comments, I'm going to assume that it's because you're interested in the process of pulling as much meaning out of this as you can, and that's why you're doing it. Okay, so Rainey and then Elizabeth. I would say that it can be dug into this way. Francis was equal to his peers of poets who stole some of his stuff, actually, as well as him borrowing some of their stuff. But I was going to also mention that the words innocent, not in a sense. That's making it way too psychological. This is, this is about a utopian dream that was smashed to pieces through Percy, his father, as he was a child. This is a utopian dream smashed to pieces and it's gone on in our psyche probably since Herod and before. It's, it's always in our psyche to cull the poor, to abuse the working class, to not give them a, a, their wage. It's gone on, it goes on, and they're the majority. And can they break out? No, why? Because they're given inferior foods, they're given inferior dwelling, dwellings, they're given inferior uh, places. The rats on the tired cement, that's all we've got is tired cement to eat, to be in, oh. whatever. And mm. um, uh, this, this opening stanza sets us up for the uh, the majority, the class of people he's talking about, that he, he had to become, that he, through his father and his father's idealism, thrown into a rabbit farm of rock through deceit, saw that uh, beginning again is, is so incredibly difficult for the penniless and the poor and the idealistic uh, because the well, we, as we go on in the poem, we'll see why. <laughs> Thank you, Rainey. Thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth, you're next and you need to, oh, there you are. Okay. I was going to have you re-aim your camera, but that works. I'm here. Um, so I, I noticed that the switching of the S as well. And I think it refers <laughs> to multiple slaughters of the innocent throughout time is what it sounds like to me, whatever the innocent are. And then um, I started thinking about the patient rats, gnaw, tired cement. Just start thinking about our food that we have today. We have so much food that's like processed food. And a lot of it does taste like tired cement. So I can see, no, seriously. I mean, like things like Pop-Tarts, for example, they just taste awful. I mean, they're, they're like rubber or, you know, cardboard, or I can see how they could be called, um, and tired would be like dried, worn out. And gnaw means it's really difficult to chew. So whatever this thing is, like Rainey said, this nourishment is, it's, has, it has no, um, there is no nourishment and it's dried up and um, lacking life. I'm done. Okay, Chris, you wanna read us the next uh, stanza? A night song and a dreadful night, batteried by the fluorescent might of strident trumpets and a fright, bellowing bitchery's delight. And uh, sounds like advertisement to me. Big, <laughs> Madison, well, it's, Madison it's Avenue. Fist, it, it's Big Fist controlling how we see what we want to be. It's it's about neon lights and the big ad for Vegemite and 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 Morton Salt and we all want these things that all the big people have and the big people are bright and they're there and we're down here eating the crumbs. It's setting it up. He's setting setting it up. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina. Yeah, I echo that. Um, that first line sums up the whole first paragraph above it. A night song and a dreadful night. I mean, it's just, he's just, that underscores the previous one. Batteried by the fluorescent might, which means what kind of might is there in a battery? Not much. And it's fluorescent. It's, it's not real light. It's fake light. 
batteried by the fluorescent might. Again, that word lent meaning without, you know, batteried by the fluorescent might. I think that's us who are battered. I think that's us who are battered. We're being battered, uh, not a battery. We're being battered. It by doesn't say lights. battered, it says batteried. Yes, we're being batteried, batteried. Yeah. Battery means like a battery. Rainy, like battery. rainy, rainy, please. Christina has the floor. I'm next, and then we can then we can come back to you. Christina, okay. go ahead. And then uh, of of strident trumpets in a fright, I think it's just what Chris was saying. It's like Madison Avenue. Bellowing bitchery's delight. As soon as I read bitchery, I I almost wanted to say butchery. Not bitchery, butchery. And I think that he kind of was playing there because I I think that there's something, there's again, like in the first paragraph, that reference to axes, there's something violent about this whole thing. It's not just that they're not doing the right thing. It's that there's some, there's an element of violence there, bellowing bitchery's delight. You know, like these people are, are liking hurting other people. Anyway, that's my sense of it. Um, and I wanted to point out, and then Elizabeth, um, there's almost a kind of synesthesia going on oh, yeah. um, where Francis, for, first of all, you don't normally think of fluorescent lights as being batteries for anything else. You think of fluorescent lights as maybe running on batteries or running on electricity, but here the fluorescents are playing the role of batteries. They are supplying the energy into the night um, but then they're not even really fluorescent lights because they're really trumpets that are that are screaming stridently. So he's got all these oh, things wow. mixed yeah. together. Yeah. And the choice of battery is also uh, interesting because of uh, what Rainey brought up. Yeah. It's, it's so close to battered and there's right. all this violence going on. And there's he's definitely. really talking about being battered by all these, this, the lights and the noise all of this technological crap. battery and butchery yeah yeah a bit of background about the fluorescent light is we were raised in melbourne melbourne was the most famous city in the world for fluorescent advertising some of the most artistic huge fluorescent advertising was in melbourne victoria and so if you're on Flinders Lane and you're in the lanes like he is with the rats and the little secondhand bookstores and then up above is just all the huge fluorescent lights battering you day and night of where you've got to go, what you've got to eat, what you've got to do, what you've got to strive for hmm. is, 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 in that, is in that line. Uh, Elizabeth. So not having any of that background that Rainey has uh, and, and knowledge of Francis the way she has, the way I look at it is so different and maybe it's in the gutter, but um, Night Song is like you know, the, instead of a nightingale song, which we think of of Hafez and associated with God and, and the, 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 the flight of the soul into the high realms, this is the, the dreadful night song. And the fluorescent um, might, I see it again, I, like, like the fluorescent lights blinking of strident trumpets. Trumpets to me are women who are prostitutes. Yeah, no, that's prostitutes. trumpets. No, no. <laughs> that's trumpets. Well, okay, these are strident <laughs> trumpets, but to me, that's what it reminded of. I mean, bellowing bitchery's delight. I mean, I, I, it just made me think of women who are being misused, you know, in society and, uh, and having to deal with it. And the- and He did the do a poem for call girls. <laughs> and the promotion, um, and then the fluorescent lights blinking off and on in these areas where they work. Okay, so anyway, I don't know, that's what came to me. Good. That's what I it reminded like, like me it. of. Uh, Chris, Sorry, why don't we- Sorry, trumpets, why don't, trumpets. <laughs> why don't we move on to the next one, Chris? All right, okay. Which wet pavements shapened, so bellowing bitteries delight, which wet pavements shapened the dreams that softly sigh, there's more than seems. Behind the fret, Beneath the screams, there flow perennial love streams. So uh, I want to put the question on the table of what witch refers to. And then I'll uh, take uh, Christina's comment. 
you don't have to address that question, but uh, I'm putting it out there. I think it, re I think it re uh, applies to the entire section of text above it, both, both paragraphs. Okay, um, back to you, Greg. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I mean, syntactically, I think it would have to apply to the trumpets. Um, trumpets in a fright, which wet pavements shape into dreams. So there's, there's at least uh, agreement in number, trumpets shape, which wet pavements shape the trumpets into dreams, but I don't kind of get the connection. Um, I sort of see it as the shadow. The shadow can be so much dance better than the real person. The shadow is so exquisite and he's seeing the shadow of all of that in a very wet city, <laughs> in, in the wet. <laughs> it constantly rains in this bloody place where I never lived there <laughs> as quick as I could. And it's, uh, he's seeing, I'm seeing this and I'm furious, but in actual fact, if I look at the beauty of it in the wet pavements, it gives you a dream, it gives you hope. It gives you perennial love streams. Uh, there is another way to break out of this other than the neon sign saying it's Morton Salt and Vegemite and, and, and the best butter and eggs and all of these gorgeous neon signs. There's another way to look at it through the wet pavements, through the vision you can see in the shadow or the reflection. Oh, I love that, Rainy. That's great. Uh, Christina. Uh, I think Rainey's on to something with the wet pavement there. To my mind, it refers to the, the whole paragraph above, but it is its own paragraph. So it, I'll just address the paragraph. To me, that reference to wet pavements is a reference to a mirror because wet pavement reflects and that mirror is in discourses and in God speaks. And I'm telling you, if he didn't, if, if he wrote wet pavements, there's no way he wouldn't have connected it with all of what Meher Baba said about consciousness as a mirror, the individual mind as a mirror, as, a, as something not real, but simply a reflection of. So to me, all of this business, this night song and a dreadful night, it's wet pavements shape into dreams. So there's underlying all of this is, is still this desire for beneath the screams, beneath the fret, there's more than seems. There's there flow perennial love streams. It makes you cry. I mean, it's like, even in all of this, the wet pavement, it's the mirror of it below it. There are love streams. I don't know. It's this is a beautiful paragraph. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I I believe that the witch refers to the four um, phrases above because if you read it, you can say wet pavement shape into dreams, witch, you know, and the witch refers to the four lines, and then the dream softly sigh, and beneath it there there's more than it seems beneath all of this stuff that seems to be flashing about and beneath the yelling and screaming there's some kind of flow that's eternal and he hasn't described it yet he hasn't described the flow perennial love streams such a tease and uh rainy you have your electronic hand up does that is that on purpose is that from two months ago Oh no, yeah. that was that was from the the uh, the beauty of wet pavements when you live in a neon <laughs> city. Okay. Huge so neon. it's uh, it's very hard for me to keep up with both visually raised hands and electronically ones. Sorry, I'll lower uh, it. If, if you do raise your electronic hand, if you can uh, lower it whenever yeah. you you have that turn, I appreciate it. Sorry. Okay, moving on, Chris. Okay. In this night, which neon makes day, the easy speakmen are raking hay for Big Fist, who doles them their pay, and nubile girls sing a roundelay. Roundelay is the right way to say it. Roundelay. Okay, uh, 
Christina, and then uh, Greg, and then whoever else raises their hand. Real simple. Uh, I mean, real short. I mean, uh, that's the fourth time he's used the word night. I'd say he wants to make a point of using the word night. And neon, that, I mean, does that relate to fluorescent? I'm going to say yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's artificial. You know, it's this artificial thing. It's not real light. It's, it is the, uh, it's the, it, yeah, it's not real light. A neon makes day. An easy, so people are being abused. They don't know day from night. And nubile girls sing a roundelay. So it's, you know, there's still sweet things happening, but it's all within an artificial abusive situation. It's still negative. Anyway, that's all. Okay, uh, I'm the only one in the queue. Um, so this is this is the first introduction of this um, this character that appears, this class of people that appears in the poem of these guys who are the spokespeople for Big Fist. It's actually the first introduction of Big Fist too. So Big Fist is sort of like the uh, the Draw military man. industrial Illuminati, the people who are running everything and imposing their agenda, and then they have their spokespeople their mouthpieces, their propagandists, and the propagandists get paid well and, and you know, have a nice life and so forth. And then uh, the nubile girls singing the rondelay show up quite a bit too. And so I, uh, Christina, you had a, a little different interpretation of that than I did. You, you take it as a sort of a, a nice thing. And I'm taking it as, um, the nubile girls are, they're being used uh, willingly and they're being enablers for Big Fist and his spokespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're being compensated in, in some way. Um, but anyway, as they show up a number of times. So um, uh, Rainey's got something on her screen. So we'll go to Rainey and then Christina. So there's one of the nubile girls and the wet pavements of Melbourne. And they were everywhere. They, <laughs> they just danced above your heads. This one's for vinegar. I Hang mean, just a second, Rainy, I can't see it because when I'm sharing my screen, that's too oh, small. Uh, I hope uh, you can see it. But it's a great while one. you're doing it so that you'll take over the screen. Okay. You. okay. Um, so these nubile girls, <laughs> the vinegar girl and the Sarabos salt chickens with a little girl with all their legs showing and everything in the in the 40s and 30s, 40s and 50s were everywhere and the pavement's always wet. Oh. And so this one's skipping, this this neon skips and sometimes it would sing. Yeah, that's so interesting because it's, I guess it's a very literal reference and looked at in that light. Yeah. It is, it is these people that are in control yeah. who are there. It's, it's not actually actual girls being used and being- It's willing, innocence. Yeah. Willing, Use uh, of innocence. Right. Yeah. So. The yeah, slaughter of the innocent. Yeah, Elizabeth, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Well, uh, Rainy, I wanted to ask you. So uh, these little, um, girls that are on the top of these buildings in neon lights do they actually uh, i mean do they actually make noise i mean i've never seen anything like that some of them have seen the vegemite song some of them there was a famous uh, a famous i suppose he was a designer that did them i actually knew his daughter when we were hippies but um <laughs> they they were huge i mean they were the size of my building a four-story building and they were on top of buildings all near the railway uh, yards. So they dominated this very cold, wet city of international wow. on the big streets and the poor on the lanes and the big, big Macy's called Myers on the big streets and the poor in the lanes. Wow. I okay. mean, that really helps to understand the poem. And, and the lanes were serviced by the working class where his father had the um, secondhand bookstore. So he was well aware of how these people and the lane serviced the big, the big streets like they do in every city. But people lived in there and, 
earned a living and were artists and artist models and all sorts of things in that city. What are lanes? Are you talking about lanes of traffic? Like, like little re teeny streets that service the toilets or the delivered goods or whatever. As time went by, they became, some of them were, had shops in them and coffee shops to help all those poor people, the working people who serviced the big streets. Oh, with wow. The emporiums and just every city has their lanes and their drop, drop things into the basements. But this city is dominated by the working class and the rich all mushed together by the, the avenues and the lanes and the avenues and the lanes. There's seven of them in a row. And up above them, the size of a four story building are all the neon ads. That's in Melbourne. Uh, Chris, go ahead. To men in shirt sleeves. Okay. To men in shirt sleeves, each alone, gnawing his flesh down to the bone, the evening is a stifled groan of the day's rasping monotone. The drudgery of work sounds to me like. You know, the patient rats again. Uh, okay, go ahead, keep, keep going. And gazing at the ghastly glow of neon's blood in silent flow, their spasms and their twitchings grow, knowing the cocks will surely crow. Morning is going to come and they're gonna to have to go back into the rat race. Right, and uh, ne what is neon's blood? Uh, yeah, okay, neon's blood in silent flow. Uh, maybe it's just a reference to the, the omnipresent advertising, the, the neon signs everywhere. Rainy well, nods your head. Uh, Christina. Well, let's recall that the reference to fluorescent before was batteried. In other words, this, the life force that, or, or the, the energy that's making the fluorescent might is batteried, you know, it isn't real. And so if neon has anything to do with battery, which it may, uh, but neon's blood would be not even real blood. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not even connected to some natural life force. Um, it's just another negative, horrible picture of a, of a, of a stanza here. I mean, this, these four lines are, yikes. So I'm taking neon's blood as literally being the gas that flows in the neon light. Um, and Francis, Francis is doing a lot throughout this poem. He's doing a lot of, um, uh, what's the word? He, he's blending, he, he's, he's blurring the lines between organic human, human living entities and robot mechanized things because that's what he feels, I think, that this society is doing to the people that live in it. So this is just one of many instances. And he's saying it's becoming our uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is next Dark. and then Rainy. Elizabeth, you're muted, you're muted darling. Thank you. <laughs> I, I did that to myself. Um, this is obviously a dystopian world. When I see it um, <laughs> gazing at the ghastly glow of neon's blood, to me, neon's blood is like the neon sign and the blood is the light that's flashing on the ground, flowing on the ground and it's spastic and twitches like a flashing uh, neon light will do if it's on the blink. Um, and I get, I don't know, I, I, maybe the spasms and twitchings grow uh, as it, gets closer to dawn because they're running low on their energy or something. I mean, the cocks will crow. That sounds like early morning hours. Um, but it could be something else. Anyway, that's how I saw the light of the, of the... Rainy, go ahead. So the neon's blood is our blood. It's become our blood. Just as it runs the neon light, that synthetic dangerous substance is now our blood and we twitch with the glow of it and and we associate with each other with some of that neon blood in in us all because the brainwash has been so complete well i'd say one more about the neon blood i don't get it the neon blood 
runs through our blood. We have been, we have taken in the glow. We have taken in the message. We have taken in the ad. We have taken in this way of life. And now the neon's blood becomes our blood and we glow and we twitch. So are you talking about desires then? Is that what he's talking about? The desires? We're talking about um, brainwashing here. In brainwashing. My, uh -huh. Brainwashing by big fists, by the, the multinational people of how the poor are all supposed to think now how what will run through your blood now what you will yes desire the desire nature is being altered to something inorganic so marketing you're talking about mark uh, the overabundance of marketing and creating desires which unnatural desires uh-huh it'll it'll come out for you elizabeth it's it's a theme that's richly developed through the through the poem uh chris go ahead take the next one Okay, and uh, keep in mind that this was written before contraceptives were, uh, you know, like the birth, the birth control pill was widely available. So this is before that happened. And youth in theaters, row on row, sit cheek to cheek and glow to glow, fearing the crop that love may sow, which they with their teeth will have to hoe. There's no, <laughs> there's no dare in that last line, Chris. Uh, which they with teeth will have to help. Yeah. Yep, you're right. With the, which they with teeth will have to help. Um, so, anybody have anything to say about that line? That, that's one of those stanzas that is actually fairly clear, at least. Um, Christina, go ahead. Yeah, and the that, last line is the one that kind of goes back into this double meaning kind of as you were saying, Greg, from actual to analogy, actual to analogy, and he kind of plays with that, um, which they with teeth will have to hoe. What does that mean? Like, well, they, you know, using their teeth to hoe, well, obviously it's chewing something. They're gonna have to chew something. I think it's back to the patient rats gnawing cement. In many right, reports. there's a lot of these things seem to be repeating. There's this, unnatural light and then there's this um chewing business and then there's a uh, um night you know it's 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 all like this it's so negative but um and but this is the first reference to youth so it's like even the future even that which has yet to even become uh is in the beginning of growing is, is fearful, you know? So it's like a fearful world. The, the, before, you know, there's spasms and twitchings grow in the middle of the night. What's that? Sounds like sex, you know? I mean, knowing the cocks will surely crow. There's a double entendre right there, double meaning. So, yep. uh, more I don't know, that. it just is all very sordid and, and negative. Uh, Elizabeth, and, negative Elizabeth and then Greg. Yep. So the, the line that bothers me the most is uh, which they with teeth will have to hoe. Like Christina, what are they talking about teeth? However, I just realized the hoe probably refers to the crop. So right. another double entendre. I can right. see the youth uh, and because of what Chris said, the fear of getting pregnant, you know, and the, the glow of the, the, the false romanticism that uh, covers up um, the fear of what could happen if they move forward, you know, without restraint, and uh, that uh, the crop being an unexpected pregnancy that this love might yield, but at the same time, the work that it's going to require um, to to harvest that crop or to raise a child or to deal with all this the problems that may come through marriage, not marriage, or whatever it may be. But um, the teeth doesn't quite fit in with the hoe. Um, so with teeth, so fearing the crop, which I said, with which they with teeth. Uh, no, let me, don't let me take a try, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, if you think can, about um, it. Uh, imagine, imagine hoeing a field with your teeth. Yeah, that's what I was it's, thinking. Uh, it's, it's going to be very really hard, painful, 
slow. <laughs> and throughout this thing, Francis is really painting this picture of a very, very hard life. It's really a very hard life. And there's, there's, a, there's a real tragedy in this paragraph because it's starting with the youth who are there enjoying a movie, enjoying each other's company, enjoying the bloom of youth, enjoying uh, their budding sexuality. And yet it's a conveyor belt into this horrible lifetime of gnawing cement to, to eke out your living. It, it's, it's very, very bleak. It's uh -huh. not negative. It is how the poor live all the time. They did then, they did before then, and they do now. It's a reality check. It's pointing out what's going on. And these kids, it's yes, not negative. it's not negative. It's just reality for so many millions and millions of people. This is reality. We, we're coming from a privileged viewpoint reading this, but this is reality. You know, I live next to People's Park. This is their reality. And they've fallen for, they're now, they can get a free ticket or get into the back door of the movies and flirt with the pretty girl and then she gets pregnant and then what do they have to do then? Then they've got to grind their teeth and gnaw even to feed them and uh, children not being fed, children not being raised, children, um, he's, he's into the youth part, falling for it. The adults like himself, probably when he first saw through all this at 20, um, just seeing at 16, just don't do all this, don't have five kids at, <laughs> when you're 17, because you're going to have to gnaw your way through cement. You're going to have to see what I've seen at 30. Elizabeth and then Christina. So I guess that when you're talking about teeth again, he's now made a person back into a rat, you know, and the, that, that whole image of conflating the rat persona with the human persona. Um, so kind of a mixed metaphor. He's mixing up all the metaphors. That's, you know, and Rainy, I, you know, I wouldn't have been thinking about the poor. It's only because you know so much about it that you might, you might go there. I might go there by the end of the poem, but I didn't see that at this point in the poem. The word uh, Christ, Christina, Christina, and then Rainy. Thank you. Um, I think it's okay when a poet describes a, a downer situation. I think that that's okay uh, because that's a good method for then setting it up for the upper. If you, if you paint a picture dark, then if you have light, it looks even more light. So um, I'm gonna request an understanding of my use of the word negative. And I don't mean bad. I mean negative, like it's a bummer, it's a downer. It's a negative situation. Uh, drug abuse is reality and negative. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, they can coexist. And when I say negative, I mean that these eights, well, we're gonna read one more, that this, these eight uh, paragraphs, I don't know. I mean, show me another way, but they seem pretty downer. You know, they, they're describing a, uh, God, and now I'm sensitive. I can't use the word negative, uh, but they seem to be describing oh, a pretty oh, downer okay. situation. <laughs> okay, Rainy, and then, and then Greg. Take it away, Rainy, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to say that the whole, the whole background of the socialist movement, and I'm not talking about modern socialism here, the whole background of the socialist movement to get rid of the upper class lords and ladies who, who ran the Irish slaves and all of the problems of Australia, all of these majority lived in the back streets, in the back blocks, in the outback without a, hardly a meal. So they rose and they became the, the socialist movement, but still even in that, their children now are, are falling for the damn neon lights, attracting them to, to um, capitalism and the right and so on. And so he's talking about a time in history in this early section that uh, was a disillusionment 
for him seeing so much in in that rise of the young ones falling for it and how tragic it, it will end up. So what year did he write uh, this? I mean, Chris, what's he Chris is Chris 62. Is Go ahead, Chris. It was written in the 50s, this book, early 50s. Oh. Um, yeah, and and that's an interesting point, Rainey. And, and it's certainly uh, that experience there in Australia translates universally. So it's, it goes, it applies to us and our society as much as it does Australia. And Chris, I believe Rainey said that they were written in uh, 61, 62. This book? Yeah, is that correct, Rainey? This was written, refined in 62. Rano typed it up in 62. But this, uh, a lot of these references, definitely having been raised in Melbourne, go back to um, his own disillusionment, uh -huh. which would have been in the 20s and 30s. Well, of his father being that. part of the uh, William Morris Socialist Movement of England. Yeah, in the in the preface that we read, it says that the word of World's End began with a short poem written uh, in 1954. But I guess you may be right that the bulk of it was written later. That's what I was thinking, 54, but probably was written later. So 54 to 62, basically, in that in that span. Um, all right, so we've got time. It's 5:25. Let's do one more stanza. That'll make a nice stopping place. Then I'd like to. Uh, close with the beloved prayer, and then uh, I'll keep the meeting room open if we want to just chit chat for a, a few minutes after the meeting. So mm -hmm. go ahead and read that last stanza, Chris. Okay, now we're getting to the good stuff here. Uh, and by the way, it's got the word phosphorescent, which echoes back to fluorescent in the first, in the first page. Okay, and let's see, uh, and smoldering bosoms, braziered snow, shines with a phosphorescent glow, hiding breast bruises that would know why joy goes quick and night so slow. Oh. Uh, Christina. Is this the most beautiful of all of the stanzas we've read, of all eight of them? To me, this is the most beautiful of them. It, it and it, it couldn't be to my mind as beautiful if it didn't have this you know the the uh bulldozer of these other stanzas ahead of it to me it's smoldering bosoms brazeared snow it means like these women are cold and white you know their bosoms are cold and white and they shine with a phosphorescent glow in other words even their light isn't even real you know, it's not, not, there's nothing real about it, that, like, that, that what these women, uh, the bosoms, you know, the, the heat of these women isn't even real. They're hiding the bruises. This is the first time we really get that this, what is underneath, you know, in that other paragraph, it said, there's more than there seems, you know, and here, bruises. Why joy goes quick. And night so slow. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Joy goes quick. There's no joy. The theater, kids in the theater, their joy, their, you know, the glow that they have with each other, it's gone because they have to think about, you know, what are we bringing babies into? And then the night so slow. Again, he ends with this word night. This is the fifth, or is it the sixth time he's used the word night? So this is all. It's all about darkness to me, and the unnatural light. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is the best, most beautiful. And I would, I would point out that um, almost invariably in situations where there is, there is all of this economic hardship and related hardship, there's always gonna be domestic abuse because it's just uh, it's just love and marriage together, you know. There, I mean, horse and carriage is what I meant to say. It's in the in that frustration. That's one of the ways that it comes out almost invariably. And so I took this as something of uh, that. It certainly had part of it as a a very literal reference to probably getting beat up. Double meaning there too. Always, yeah. Uh, Rainey, did you have a comment? 
Yeah, I, I absolutely love this. Uh, uh, this transistorized breasts and this whole thing of um, <laughs> railway lines. And it's, it's also very much through uh, a lot of Francis's work, um, being is dying by loving particularly, there's a couple of, he, he wasn't in a dream about women at all. He really had worked a lot of that out. Um, and, you know, the death of his sister through poverty and stuff, he'd really seen a lot about women and he he's not reluctant to put it in Baba poems at all in Stay With God in um, in uh, this piece I'm talking about. Uh, there's two wonderful, uh, one called Stop, Look and Listen, which is about women's abuse and women's- Can you speak up, Rainy? You're kind of getting soft, couldn't hear you. I, I'm ambling, but anyway, because I'm flooding with a thousand books and references now, but oh. he's not reluctant to, to talk about the abuse of women and the to prostitutes amateur and professional as Christina was mentioning that poem I have a letter somewhere uh, addressed to somebody who asked questions about that poem that his attitude towards women is quite um, as liberated as anybody could be today for a man it's um, it's incredibly touching that's because he saw so much when he was young and and his formative years as a painter then a pianist and then a poet all right. Um, well, time to close for today. Awesome. Uh, awesome. So thank you for doing this, Greg. Thank you thank for you, thanking me. And, and I really enjoyed it. You guys <laughs> yeah. all bring so much to this. And really, I mean, that's why I like to do these things, because I want a the motivation for myself to really dig into them. But then when that's combined with what all of you know about this stuff, I mean, it's fantastic. And this point will never be the same for me after we go through this. I, I know it. So, so thank you. So if you will un all unmute for the beloved prayer so that we can have a, a lovely jumble. And, uh, <laughs> and then we can chit chat if we like.